Okay, loaves three and four are finished with bulk fermentation. These were our warmest loaves, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius. These finished up in three and a half hours from the time that I mixed the dough. So from the time I added flour, water, and starter until I just took these out, they have risen about 25%, and it's been three and a half hours since I started. Now this chart shows the percent rise in the dough in 30 minute increments. And interestingly, you can see in that last 30 minutes between the three hour and the three and a half hour mark, this dough went from an 8% increase in volume to 25% increase. So this dough almost got away from me at the end. And this is indicative of what I talked about earlier in the video, where in that last 30 minutes of fermentation at high temperatures, things can really move very quickly. Now, the tartine recipe recommends a bulk fermentation that you should look for a rise of 20 to 30%. I'm cutting these off at 25% because these are the warmest loaves and I'm going to put these into a shaping basket. One of them will go into the refrigerator, one will stay on the countertop. But what you have to realize what happens here is that the dough maintains this warm temperature even when it goes into the refrigerator. So the bulk fermentation, although we're officially calling the end of it when, we, when I put these into the shaping baskets, the fermentation process continues. When these go into the refrigerator, it will take three, four, five hours for the, the bulk fermented dough to get down to refrigerator temperature. And then the second loaf, which I'm going to do a final proof on the countertop, it'll stay well above the countertop room temperature uh, for a couple hours as well. So, so these are, we're cutting off a little bit before the 30% rise, which I think I'm gonna let the other loaves go to. <clears throat> so here's an important chart to consider as we move forward. This is from a bake that I did a couple of weeks ago, where after I shaped a loaf, I put it into the refrigerator and I used a continuous measuring probe thermometer in the refrigerator and measured the dough temperature as it came down to refrigerator temperature. And this really illustrates the point I was just making. I put a loaf in the refrigerator at 78 degrees Fahrenheit. It took three and a half hours for that loaf to get down to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 10 degrees Celsius where the fermentation really starts to slow down. So there was a full three, three and a half hours of continuing fermentation going on in the refrigerator. So you always have to remember that, that when we talk about putting the dough into the refrigerator for a cold retard, retard means slow down. It doesn't mean it stops. Uh, many people think that as soon as you put the dough in the refrigerator, it immediately goes to the refrigerator temperature. It takes a long time to get there, in fact, in this case, it took 10 hours to actually get down to the refrigerator temperature, which was 39 degrees Fahrenheit or 3.9 degrees Celsius. So for the loaf that I put in the refrigerator, I'm going to do the continuous measuring probe thermometer, and we'll measure this one to see how long it takes to go from this 90 degree current temperature down to the refrigerator temperature. And I'm just double checking. This is actually sitting at 91 degrees Fahrenheit, so it came out of the proofing chamber slightly hotter than we had expected. I'm gonna move quickly on these because these are still fermenting right before our eyes. Now, normally at this step in the process, I would do pre-shaping, a 30 minute bench rest and final shaping of these loaves. But because we're really interested just in the impact of temperature and time on bulk fermentation, I don't wanna introduce any irregularities into the crumb through the shaping process. I really wanna be able to inspect the crumb across all four loaves just looking at the impact of bulk fermentation time and temperature. So I'm going to remove the dough from this fermentation vessel and see how it looks. I'm just starting to see some bubbles forming on the top. So normally I would see more bubbles, but as I'm pulling the dough out, I can really see the gluten strands in here that indicates that this dough is pretty far along at that high temperature. And as I've mentioned many times, when this dough ferments at that 90 degree temperature, it's releasing the protease enzyme, which wants to break down and eat the gluten structure. So we're always at risk of gluten deterioration when you're bulk fermenting at that high temperature. This dough looks okay. It's pretty far along, but you can see it's standing up on the countertop pretty nicely. So it has, it's not completely flattened out. It's definitely not underproofed. It's pushing towards overproofing more than not.
So at this point, I'm just gonna move this into a shaping basket. So I use these loaf pans with a little wooden insert in here that I made, which reduces the size of the pan effectively for these smaller sized loaves. So this is loaf number three. I'm just gonna do a very light dusting of flour to create some semblance of a top of this loaf. That's the top. And then I'll carefully try to flip this into that pan. That dough is pretty loose, so it's pretty far along. It's warm, but it's not severely overproofed. I think that loaf is gonna be okay. I also like to shake the loaf once it's in the pan. You can see there's a lot of movement in there. That loaf is pretty far along. That's loaf number three. This is gonna go in the refrigerator along with loaves one and two for an overnight cold retard, and then we'll bake that up tomorrow. Loaf number four, this is the brother of loaf number three. This one we're gonna leave on the countertop and do a countertop final proof. So in the tartine recipe, there are two options for final proofing. There's the overnight cold retard, which is the more popular approach that people take, but you can also do a countertop final proof for three to four hours and then bake this the same day. You don't get as much of the flavor development in the loaf when you do the same day loaf, but it makes a perfectly nice loaf of bread. So the reason I'm doing this one on the countertop is because I wanna measure the dough temperature on the countertop for a few hours to see what happens with the dough temperature when you leave it at room temperature. So this will be another experiment on how you could possibly accelerate that countertop proofing time or need to accelerate it if you're working in a warm weather environment. That's my shaping. Again, that dough is warm and loose, really far along compared to normal proofing, or it feels that way because the dough is so active at that warm temperature. So here's loaf number four, give it a shake. It's a pretty loose loaf, pretty far along, but I hope it's not overproofed. Loaf number three goes into the fridge overnight. Loaf number four stays on the countertop and I'll be monitoring the internal temperature of these two loaves from now on. Loaf number two is done with bulk fermentation. This bulk fermented for exactly five hours and it's risen just about 25% like the others. Now this chart shows the percent rise in the dough in 30 minute increments and similar to what we saw in loaves three and four, you see that big uptick in the last 30 minutes. Here it was between four and a half and five hours where we went from a 12% increase in the dough to 25% increase in that last 30 minutes. Let's take it out and see what it looks like. Okay, this was our 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius bulk fermentation. This looks like a typical tartine bulk fermentation and the five hour window is pretty consistent with what I typically see when I make the standard tartine recipe, which is roughly in the range of this temperature. That dough is sitting up fairly nicely. Looks like it's nicely proofed. I'm just gonna flip that into the basket. Give that a shake. That looks pretty good. That's a pretty typical looking uh, slab of dough coming out of bulk fermentation at that temperature. I'm gonna put this in the refrigerator for overnight cold retard with the other loaves and I'll track the temperature every 30 minutes. Bulk fermentation is done for loaf number one. So this dough bulk fermented at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius for seven and a half hours. 
it has risen exactly 25%. This chart shows the percent rise in the dough in 30 minute increments and at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius, you can see this dough had a little bit more of a plateau in the middle of the bulk fermentation, but again, that very steep rise at the very end of the bulk fermentation process. Here it was between hours seven and seven and a half hours. So let's take this out and see how it looks. So that dough looks pretty good. It's pretty well proofed. It's pretty far along. It's definitely done here at seven and a half hours. So similarly, that 25% rise uh, is more than enough with this recipe, even with the lower temperature loaves like this. That looks pretty good. That, that dough is fairly firm. Similar to the others, we're not interested in shaping this. I'm just gonna flip it into the basket so that we can evaluate what the crumb looks like based on these different bulk fermentation times and temperatures. That's what we're really focused on. We can assume that the shaping would be the same on all of them, but what I found is that the shaping actually introduces irregularity in the crumb, and then you really can't tell what happened exactly in bulk fermentation. That dough feels pretty good. That's firmer than some of the other ones. Give that a little shake for the camera. That's a pretty good looking loaf. This will go into the refrigerator for an overnight cold retard with the other loaves. I'll track the temperature on this every 30 minutes. So now that we've completed bulk fermentation, let's take a look at some data to see what we can learn from this experiment so far. So in this first chart, we look at the bulk fermentation. This is showing the percent rise in the dough over time in 30 minute increments across the bottom for the three different batches of dough. Now this looks like what you would expect. You see the loaves three and four, the 90 degree loaves at 32 degrees Celsius. These bulk fermented more quickly. The 74 degree loaf, 24 degrees Celsius bulk fermented more slowly and the 82 degree loaf fell somewhere in the middle. But this shows that the shape of those curves is fairly similar, that they start off at a fairly low climb and then they make a big turn at the end. So that's very interesting, you know, based on the three different temperature profiles of this dough, those curves actually look very similar, more similar than I expected. And this demonstrates what we talked about in part one, that bulk fermentation activity is clearly a function of temperature. When you turn up the temperature, the activity happens faster. You turn down the temperature, it happens slower. The yeast doesn't know what time it is. It only knows the temperature and it behaves very similarly based on that temperature change as if the, the thermometer is a clock. Now in the second chart, this is really interesting. What I did was I took those three curves from the prior chart and I equalized them for time. So on the bottom, horizontal axis here, what I've done is I've expressed each one of those three curves as a percentage of its total bulk fermentation duration. So this equalizes them the different times it puts them all on the same scale. Now this is fascinating because when you lay them on top of each other, you see these curves line up very closely to each other. So when I talked about the relationship between bulk fermentation activity and temperature, it is very highly correlated as you see through this chart, very predictable. And the most interesting thing on this chart is that at that 85% mark, 85% of the way through bulk fermentation, regardless of the, the number of total hours, at that 85% of duration, you see this steep inflection point in the curve where you get the hockey stick effect and the vast majority of the, the fermentation activity expressed as a percent rise in the dough happens in that last 15% of the bulk fermentation time. And that was incredibly consistent across all three of these batches, that inflection point at the 85% mark. So how can you use this? You can calculate what that last 15% of time is based on any expected bulk fermentation time. So if I have an expected bulk fermentation time of four hours, the last 15% of time is 36 minutes. If I have a bulk fermentation time expected of six hours, it's 54 minutes. And if I have a bulk fermentation time of eight hours, it's 72 minutes, the last 15% of time. 
And if you wonder, how did I do that math so quickly? As I was doing this analysis, there's a very simple rule of thumb that if you take the bulk fermentation hours times the number nine, that will give you the minutes that represent the last 15% of the bulk fermentation time. So five hour bulk fermentation, 45 minutes is the last 15%. 10 hours of bulk fermentation, 90 minutes is the last 15%. That's when you really wanna watch the dough to cut off your fermentation based on looking at the dough and how, how it looks and how it's behaving. That at least compresses it into a window so that you can free up some of your other time during bulk fermentation activities. And now lastly, when we look at this chart, you have to look a little bit more deeply and there's something really fascinating on here, is that even though these three lines generally follow that same curve, there's also another pattern in here. And what you can see is that based on the temperature of these loaves, the low temperature, the medium temperature, and the high temperature, the low temperature curve is on the top, the medium temperature curve is in the middle, and the high temperature curve is on the bottom. So if you look at this, you see that the blue line, which was our 75 degree Fahrenheit, 24 degree loaf, this one had more of a slow climb, kind of a plateau, and then a, a less steep climb at the very end. Contrast that with the gray line, which was the 90 degree Fahrenheit, 32 degree Celsius loaf. This one had an incredibly steep climb at the end. So this is what I was talking about early in the video, is that while this relationship between temperature and yeast activity is very highly correlated, it's not a perfectly linear relationship. If it were, all three of these lines would have lined up exactly on top of each other. But what you see here with this pattern of the cool loaf, the medium loaf, and the warm loaf in that order, in that sequence, shows that the bulk fermentation activity at higher temperatures behaves differently. It got off to a slow start and then it takes an extremely hard turn at the inflection point and climbs very quickly. So there is another factor here going on. It's this compounding effect of the yeast reproducing and the yeast eating the starches and sugars more quickly. You can really see that in this chart. Now, what does all this mean? That factor is incredibly important to be aware of because that will help you stop your loaves from overproofing. Let's go back to chart number one. When I hit that 25% rise mark on loaf number three and four, our warm loaves, if I let that go for 30 more minutes, look how steep that curve is. In 30 minutes on that loaf at the high temperature, you're gonna wildly overproof that loaf very quickly. If I let my cool loaf, 74 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius, go an extra 30 minutes, I'm at a little bit less of a steep curve. So 30 minutes of extra proofing time at a cool temperature does not give you the same steepness of the curve as 30 minutes of proofing time at the warm temperature. That's why these warm loaves overproof incredibly quickly. They can get away from you in 15 minutes, literally. Whereas a cooler loaf, you may have a 30 minute, 45 minute window at the end that would be the equivalent of a 15 minute window on a warm loaf. And then the third chart that I wanna share explores the rule of thumb that we talked about in part one which hypothesizes that the fermentation activity doubles with every 15 degree Fahrenheit or eight degree Celsius change in temperature. We can compare our actual results from these three experiments to that hypothesis. So I've done that in this chart. What you see here is I have the actual hours in the column that says actual BF hours. That's the observed hours from this experiment. And then I did the calculation of the rule of thumb but the calculation differs depending on which loaf you use as the benchmark. So I did it all three ways. I calculated the expected doubling effect using loaves three and four as a benchmark, loaf two as a benchmark, and loaf one as a benchmark. And then what I show here is the calculated times and in parentheses under the calculated times in each of those cells, you see the variance between the calculated time and the actual time. That shows how accurate the calculation would have been. What you can see here is it's incredibly accurate. I mean, some of these came out within 15 minutes of the expected time. One of the observations came out 30 minute difference. That's an incredibly tight range of calculation variance. So I was surprised by this because I've kept meticulous records over 10 months of baking now, and I did not see quite as much consistency in my 
bulk fermentation times and bulk fermentation temperature as we saw in this experiment, but this is the first time I ever did such a highly controlled experiment. So what I can say is, in a highly controlled experiment, in my sample size of three data points here, that calculation is very close. I would use that as a rule of thumb for sure, but with small variations in temperature or any variations in the recipe, you could get really wildly different calculations coming out of this compared to the actuals. So these three charts give us some tools that we can use to manage our time and temperature and bulk fermentation in the future. Now let's get back to the experiment. So loaf number four has been sitting on the countertop for 90 minutes doing a countertop proof. The tartine recipe for the countertop proof option recommends three to four hours at a warm room temperature of 75 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Because this loaf bulk fermented at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, it's still carrying that bulk fermentation temperature forward and it's not even approaching room temperature yet. So this started at 90 degrees when I shaped it, I put it into the ba shaping basket. It lost about five degrees just from that handling going into the shaping basket. So it went down to 85 degrees Fahrenheit or about 30 degrees Celsius, right as I put it into the basket. Then since then, I've had this Bluetooth probe thermometer in here and I've been tracking it and it's gone from 85 degrees, 84, 81, and now it's sitting at 80 degrees Fahrenheit after 90 minutes. So what we have to do is compare 90 minutes at a proofing temperature in the low 80s to what is recommended three to four hours of a proofing temperature in the high 70s. Because this dough is also pretty far along because it, it bulk fermented at such a high temperature, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, I think this dough is ready to bake. So I'm gonna do the poke test. I don't typically rely on the poke test because it can also be unreliable. But in this case, I don't really have anything else to go on. And because these times are so wildly out of sorts with what I usually do, I'm gonna give it a try. And what you do is you poke the dough and if it comes halfway back, that means that it's ready to bake. If the indentation stays in, it means it's overproofed. It's coming back about halfway, but this loaf is incredibly soft. This is really pushing overproofing in my opinion. And I can also tell that it's not rising at all, which is a bad sign because that means that even though the yeast is still working, the gluten structure may be deteriorating at the same time which just causes the loaf to look kind of lifeless. So I'm gonna call it done and we're gonna bake this. So we're 90 minutes into the countertop proof and this loaf was amazingly fast. So we started this loaf five hours ago from the time I mixed the flour, the water and the starter. It bulk fermented for three and a half hours at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius. It sat on the countertop in the roughly low 80s for 90 minutes, so this is five hours start to finish. It's the fastest tartine loaf I've ever baked. So we'll see how this comes out. So I'm going to dust this with some rice flour. This is also gonna be incredibly difficult to get out of this shaping basket because the loaf is so wet and sticky. And because I didn't do any pre-shaping or final shaping on these loaves, I'm really just baking a slab of bulk fermented dough. This loaf has essentially no structure that we've created either. So this is gonna be a pretty sloppy loaf. Okay, it released from the towel. You can see how flat and shapeless this is. What I am gonna do is I'm just gonna take my bench knife and I'm gonna do a little tuck on both sides to try to get this into some semblance of a loaf in the pan. Okay, I just gave that a little tuck around the edges to try to get that into something that'll stand up in the pan, but it's gonna be a pretty flat loaf. And now I'm gonna to try to score this. It's gonna be incredibly sticky to drag this blade through. Kind of scored it. That loaf looks pretty overproofed. We'll see how it bakes up. <laughs> 
So this will go into the oven in my preheated Dutch oven. It's been preheating at 500 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 260 degrees Celsius. I turn it down to 450 degrees Fahrenheit. When I put this in, it's 232 degrees Celsius. It'll bake for 20 minutes with the lid on and then about 15, 15 minutes with the lid off. Loaf number four is out of the oven. It baked for 35 minutes. Let's take a look. So it's a little bit of a shapeless slab of dough, um, but you have to recall, we didn't do any stretching and folding. We did not do any pre-shaping or any final shaping. We're really interested in comparing the crumb based on the fermentation time. So this looks like it's definitely leaning towards overproofing just based on the shape and the color and the fact that the scoring didn't open up. This loaf has lost some of its internal structure. So we're gonna let this cool. We'll let all the loaves bake and cool. Then we'll cut them open and compare the crumb to see what the difference on the crumb looks like based on the fermentation times. It is the morning of day two. It's time to bake up the remaining three loaves where we did an overnight cold proof in the refrigerator. Now all these loaves will have cold proof for 12 hours as I'm taking them out of the refrigerator. This is loaf number three. So we baked up loaf number four yesterday. That one we did the countertop final proof. I'm baking loaf number three now, and then we'll do two and then one. So we're baking these in the reverse order of which I made the dough because of the shorter fermentation times on the latter loaves. So in this video, the last shall be first and the first shall be last for, from a baking perspective. Now, as I take each one of these loaves out of the refrigerator, let's look at what happens in the refrigerator. So I've created a chart for each one of these that I'll put up on the screen. And what you can see here is that this loaf went into the refrigerator at its bulk fermentation temperature of 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32 degrees Celsius. And then it's really important to note that for that first three hours or so that it's in the refrigerator, the dough is still fermenting. The temperature is up in the 90s, 80s, 70s, 60s. It takes a full three hours until that temperature gets down to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 10 degrees Celsius. That's when the fermentation really starts to slow down, in my opinion. It doesn't completely stop. But I look at that first three hour period as a continuation of the fermentation process. It's very important to know that because a lot of people, when they put their dough into the refrigerator, people will even describe it and say that it's like you're hitting the pause button on your loaf. It's really not like hitting the pause button. It's really more like a slowdown. So people think that immediately when you put the dough in the refrigerator, it goes to the refrigerator temperature. It takes a long time. So it takes three hours just to slow down the fermentation. Then it took a full 12 hours until this hit my refrigerator temperature of 33 degrees Fahrenheit, which is just above freezing. Now, the other thing to note is that I put this loaf on the bottom shelf of my refrigerator, which is the coldest spot. Because this loaf was pretty far along, it had the highest internal dough temperature. I wanted to bring that temperature down as quickly as possible. So I put it in the coldest spot, which is my bottom shelf. The top shelf of my refrigerator is actually 42 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, which is 5.6 degrees Celsius. That's fairly warm for a refrigerator. So it's important when you're putting these loaves in the refrigerator, always put a thermometer with them. I either use my continuous read thermometer, which I used on these loaves, or I use these small refrigerator thermometers. I just put one right on top of each loaf. And you'll see in Fahrenheit, seven degrees difference between the top and the bottom shelf, or four degrees difference in Celsius. That has a material impact on long bulk fermentation times. So let's take a look at the loaf. Now, when you put loaves in the refrigerator, I rarely see any rise in the dough in the refrigerator because what's happening is even though the yeast is still fermenting and it's still aerating the dough, when you cool down a gas, you cool down the carbon dioxide, it actually shrinks the carbon dioxide. So those two things counteract each other. The cold temperature shrinks the loaf, the yeast is trying to inflate the loaf, and it stays about the same as what it, when it went in. Sometimes you'll see a little bit of uh, inflation of the dough, but, but not typically. Then I dust the bottom with rice flour to keep this from sticking. 
I use this parchment paper that I cut into a diamond shape that works as a sling. These are the inserts that I use in these pans. If I'm making 333 gram flour weight loaves, I use the full pan, 250 gram flour weight. I use my inserts. It just keeps the loaves from spreading out. So this is our 90 degree Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius loaf. This is the sister loaf of the one that we baked up yesterday after the countertop proof. Just touching the sides of this, I can tell that this loaf is pretty slack also. These, these were definitely pushing over proofing uh, coming out of bulk fermentation. They really ran away from me at the end of that process. The last 30 minutes or so of that bulk fermentation on these very warm loaves, we saw a huge increase in the percent rise, and that's when the dough really started to break down, in my opinion. I'll go through that in more detail when we cut these open. Then I'm just going to score all of these, and just as a reminder, these loaves had no stretching and folding, no pre-shaping, no final shaping. This is just a slab of bulk fermented dough for the purpose of evaluating the impact of bulk fermentation on the crumb, untouched by human hands, which can introduce other regularities into it, irregularities. Let's get this in the oven. Okay, loaf number three is out of the oven. It baked for 37 minutes. Let's take a look. So this loaf bulk fermented at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius for three and a half hours. It rose 25% in volume, and we put it into the refrigerator for an overnight cold retard for 12 hours. No stretch and folds, no pre-shaping, no final shaping. That's a pretty good looking loaf. It doesn't have the height or shape of a traditional loaf, but the ear actually opened up. You can see there's some decent gluten structure still in there. This loaf and its sister loaf number four both overproofed a little bit, in my opinion, in that last 30 minutes of bulk fermentation. I could tell the dough really ran away. Here's a comparison of three and four, which is interesting. So loaf number four, we sat on the countertop for two hours and then baked it. You could see that really continued to ferment and spread out. Loaf number three, we retarded the fermentation by getting it into the refrigerator, and that kept its shape a little bit better. It'll be interesting to compare the crumb on these and compare them to the other loaves. We'll get the other two baked up and then cut everything open. Loaf number two is ready for scoring and baking. This loaf bulk fermented at 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius for five hours. It then went into the refrigerator for a 12 hour overnight cold retard. Let's take a look at the temperature chart. So you can see from this chart what happened in the refrigerator. So the loaf went into the refrigerator at 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Similar to loaf, loaf number three, it took about three hours to get down to 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius. So still that slowed down fermentation occurring for a good three hours. And then this loaf I put on the middle shelf of my refrigerator which came out at the end at 36 degrees Fahrenheit, 2.2 degrees Celsius. So a couple of degrees warmer than loaf number three, which was on my bottom shelf, which was at 33 degrees, which is less than one degree Celsius. So that shelf placement really does matter in terms of the temperature. Let's score this and bake it. Now at that bulk fermentation temperature of 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius, this loaf is very close to the standard tartine recipe loaf. That's the high end of the range that they recommend for bulk fermentation in that recipe. So this one should come out as similar to the crumb of my standard tartine loaves as any of these four that we've baked. We'll see when we cut these open. You can see this loaf right away as soon as I take the um, fabric off of it, it's standing up taller than loaf, loaves three and four, which really flattened out. So this one did not deteriorate as much um, because of the temperature that we were fermenting at, even though it bulk fermented for a longer time. Loaves three and four went for three and a half hours. Loaf two went for five hours. 
with no detrimental effect because of that lower temperature. Yeah, I can tell already this loaf is not flattening out. It's not sitting down on the countertop the way that those others did. Let's score it. That dough feels firmer to me as I'm scoring it as well. Feeling less drag against the blade. Let's get this in the oven. Loaf number two is out of the oven. This one baked for 39 minutes, so it went a little bit longer and it baked up a little more blonde in color, which is interesting. It could be that my oven did not get fully back to temperature between the two loaves. So this is loaf number two. This bulk fermented for five hours at 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius. This has pretty good rise, pretty good shape. Got a little bit of an ear there. That looks like a pretty good loaf. Not dissimilar from loaf number three, which was our 90 degree Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius loaf. I'll compare all of these to each other when we're done. I'll let these cool while we finish up baking loaf number one. Loaf number one is ready for scoring and baking. Loaf number one bulk fermented for seven and a half hours at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius. It rose 25% during that time. Then it went into the refrigerator for an overnight cold retard of 12 hours, like all the other loaves. I measured this with my continuous probe thermometer. Let's take a look at this temperature chart. So loaf number one went into the refrigerator at that starting temperature of 75 degrees Fahrenheit, similar to the other loaves. They all hit that 50 degree Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius after about three hours. Now this loaf, I did not put on the top shelf of my refrigerator, but one shelf down from the top, which is a warmer spot in my refrigerator than the others. So this ended up at 40 degrees Fahrenheit refrigerator temperature, which is 4.4 degrees Celsius. So you can see there's quite a bit of difference depending on what shelf you put these on. So the rationale was I took the warmer loaves and put those in the colder spots in the refrigerator. I took my coolest loaf, relatively speaking, put that in the warmest spot in the refrigerator. This is still fermenting at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. The fermentation doesn't really shut down completely until you get down to about 37 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about three degrees Celsius. So let's score this and bake it. Now just looking at how this dough is sitting up on the countertop, it's not quite standing up as tall as loaf number two, interestingly, and it might just because be because of that slightly warmer refrigerator temperature on this one. It looks better than loaf three, um, but not quite as tall as loaf two, so this will be interesting to compare. Let's score it. It did not feel as firm as loaf number two on the scoring either. So that few degrees higher temperature in the refrigerator may have had an impact on this loaf. Let's get it in the oven. Loaf number one is out of the oven. This baked for 39 minutes, similar to loaf number two. It went a little bit longer. That's a pretty good looking loaf. Similar to loaf number two, decent rise on that, decent height. It opened up on the scoring. Um, not a lot more to say here. We'll let these cool and then I'll do a full comparison of all four of these when we can cut them open. Now in this chart, we compare the three curves. So these are the three temperature curves for the three loaves that, that overnight cold retarded in the refrigerator. I showed these individually, but I'm just showing them here combined now. And it's interesting, what you can see is that the 90 degree loaf, the 82 degree loaf, and the 75 degree loaf, these are in Fahrenheit. Those all 
reduced their temperature fairly quickly and they converged right about at that three hour mark at 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius. So in those first three hours, you're still getting significant fermentation activity and depending on your starting temperature, you're getting more activity. You can see that the area under the curve essentially is higher for the 90 degree loaf than it is for the 75 degree loaf. So in that first three hours, you're definitely still getting some fermentation. When you turn that corner from 50 degrees Fahrenheit down to the refrigerator temperature, you can see that the curves really flatten out pretty significantly. And there is still fermentation going on at those temperatures, but it's at a much slower rate. And then if you look all the way over at the 12 hour mark, it takes 12 full hours for these loaves to get to refrigerator temperature. And depending which shelf you put the loaf on in the refrigerator, I'm seeing a seven degree difference here in Fahrenheit uh, between the top shelf and the bottom shelf in terms of my refrigerator temperature. So that's also important to note. So before we cut into the loaves, let's just look at them on the outside. So just to recap, loaf number one, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius, bulk fermented for seven and a half hours. Loaf number two, 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius, bulk fermented for five hours. Loaf number three and four, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, bulk fermentation. These bulk fermented for three and a half hours. Loaves one, two, and three went into the refrigerator for 12 hour overnight cold retard. Loaf four remained on the countertop for two hours for a countertop final proof. The idea behind this experiment was that we could bulk ferment these loaves at very different temperatures. And by controlling the time, we would end up with the same amount of proofing or the same looking crumb in all four of the loaves. We'll see when we cut them open. But just looking at them from the outside, it's obvious that number four stands out from the group. This is the one that sat at the countertop. It really continued proofing because it took that bulk fermentation temperature of 90 degrees Fahrenheit into its countertop proofing. So it really wasn't proofing at room temperature. It was still in the high 80s Fahrenheit or the high 20s Celsius. So loaf four looks pretty over proof just based on the shape of it. We'll see when we cut it open. I don't know for sure. Loaves one, two, and three though, when you look at these, this is really fascinating and this was really the goal of the experiment. And then let me just remind people, there was no stretching and folding done on any of these loaves. This is just bulk fermented dough, no pre-shaping and no final shaping. So this is solely the impact of bulk fermentation untouched by human hands. Look at these three loaves, seven and a half hours, five hours, three and a half hours. These look exactly the same to me. I mean, if I mix these up, do the three loaf Monty here and said, okay, pick out the three and a half hour loaf, pick out the seven and a half hour loaf. If I didn't have the flags here, I wouldn't be able to do it. it. So this really demonstrates part of what I was trying to accomplish is to demonstrate that the yeast doesn't know what time it is. The yeast doesn't know how long it's been in bulk fermentation. It only knows the temperature. The thermometer is the clock if you're a yeast cell. When the temperature goes up, you go faster. When the temperature goes down, you go slower. This really demonstrates it very effectively. Now, one of the other things that we were trying to prove here or disprove was the theory that bulk fermentation activity doubles with a 15 degree change in temperature in Fahrenheit or an eight degree change in Celsius. And we came out pretty close to that here. So loaf number three was three and a half hours of bulk fermentation Loaf number one was seven and a half hours of bulk fermentation, a little more than double. We'll see when we cut these open, but that rule of thumb seems to be pretty close. The last thing I'll point out is that the two loaves that bulk fermented at the higher temperature, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, these baked up a little bit darker. And you'll often see that when you have loaves that are pushing towards overproofing, is you get more of the sugars that release to the surface. So that little darker crust is a little bit of an indication of potential overproofing. So this is the moment of truth where we compare the crumb. I just cut each one of these loaves in half. Let's take a look. Loaf number one, 
This is our 75 degree Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius loaf. This bulk fermented for seven and a half hours. That's a pretty good looking crumb right there. Maybe leaning towards overproofing. It's a little bit more dense than you would prefer, but that's a pretty good looking crumb. Loaf number two. This is our 82 degree Fahrenheit, 28 degree Celsius loaf that bulk fermented for five hours. That's a little bit more open crumb, maybe a touch underproofed based on that little tunnel at the top. That's just barely done at 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius, a little more open crumb. This is also much more in the range of the standard tartine recipe. So when you think about the recipe really being optimized for a certain temperature, you actually see a little bit of that in this crumb because that's where this recipe is really designed to work most effectively. Loaf number three, this is our 90 degree Fahrenheit, 32 degree Celsius bulk fermented dough. I thought this dough would be wildly overproofed, but it really is not. It's a touch leaning towards overproofing with the real small dense cells that you see there, similar to loaf number one actually, but not wildly overproofed and still some structure to the loaf. This looks almost identical to loaf number one. I mean, look at that. This is essentially what we were trying to demonstrate through this experiment. Uh, seven and a half hours on the left, three and a half hours on the right, you get almost the exact same crumb by adjusting your bulk fermentation time to compensate for differences in temperature. And then loaf number four, this one also bulk fermented at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius. Unlike the others where we did an overnight cold retard in the refrigerator, this one we did a countertop proof to see what impact that would have. That's not a bad looking crumb. Actually it looks slightly underbaked there right in the middle. But I thought this loaf would be wildly overproofed as well. It's definitely pushing overproofing on some of these warmer loaves, but not, not horrible. There's still some openness to that crumb. And again, this was with no shaping no pre-shaping, no final shaping. I mean, if we had shaped this up, really an expert shaper could probably have uh, gotten a decent looking loaf out of that. So that's the comparison of the bisection. Let's now compare them side by side. Now that's really revealing. Again, the purpose of the experiment was to show that wildly different bulk fermentation temperatures can be compensated for by adjusting the bulk fermentation time. And I also stuck with a pretty consistent percent rise on these, 25% rise. I think on the warm loaves, loaves three and four that were bulk fermenting at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, going up to that 25% rise to, to be consistent with the other two, overshot the target a little bit. These are slightly overproofed compared to where they should have been because when you get up at that high temperature, everything happens so much more quickly. Let me show you a chart that I prepared just to demonstrate this. You can see what happened with loaf three and four, the 90 degree Fahrenheit, 32 degree Celsius loaves. I was tracking the percent rise in the dough in milliliters every half hour, 0%, 0%, 1%, 1%, 4% rise after two and a half hours, 8% rise after three hours. Look at that change between three hours and three and a half hours. It went from an 8% rise to 25% rise in the dough. That's where that dough really just got away from me because things happen at higher temperatures incredibly quickly. And as I mentioned in the opening comments of this video, 30 minutes of fermentation at the end of the process is very different than 30 minutes at the beginning of the process because the yeast is reproducing as well as operating at that higher temperature. So when you're in that last 30 minutes at high temperature, things can run away from you very quickly which is, I mean, you can't demonstrate it more effectively than just looking at that chart. I mean, that bread just ran away in the last 30 minutes. Luckily, we caught it at that 25% rise. If we had let it go even 15 minutes more, it could have wildly overproofed. So there's the side-by-side -side comparison. I think all of these loaves really pushed the proofing a little bit further than I wanted, maybe except for loaf number two. But in terms of proving that you can get a consistent crumb regardless of bulk fermentation temperature. I mean, that shows that right there, you can't ask for a better example.
Sometimes the bisection doesn't tell the whole story, so now I'm going to slice these down into individual slices and see if there's anything more going on in these lobes that we can learn. So sometimes the bisection doesn't tell the whole story, so I like to cut these into slices and do a better comparison. I cut half of each one of the loaves into slices. This is extraordinary. I mean, sometimes the picture speaks more than a thousand words. Look at the uniformity across these slices across the four loaves. It's almost unbelievable. And just for the record, loaf number one, 74 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius, seven and a half hour bulk fermentation. Loaf number two, 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius, five hours bulk fermentation. Loaves number three and four, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, three and a half hour bulk fermentation. Loaves one, two, and three spent 12 hours in the fridge. Loaf four spent two hours on the countertop. These look like they're from the exact same loaf of bread. If I mixed up these loaves, if I mixed up these slices and tried to put them back together again, I couldn't do it. I don't think anybody could do it. So this, after a 36 hour baking odyssey, really demonstrates what I had intended right from the start, that regardless of the bulk fermentation temperature, you can compensate for it by changing the time and come up with the exact same fermentation rate, exact same crumb, across all four of these loaves. This is really quite extraordinary and even more uniformity than I expected when I began this experiment. That's pretty amazing. And loaf number two, interestingly, which I thought might have been underproofed based on the bisection cut, doesn't really show as much of an indication of it here in the slices. I mean, just looking across the slices this way, uniformity is just amazing. I couldn't be happier with this. So I realized there was a lot going on in this video, a lot of science, a lot of math, a lot of temperature taking, a lot of details, charts and graphs. I'm still learning as I go through each one of these videos, I'm learning as I go. So let me just recap some of the key things that I found just as a summary of some of the techniques that you want to remember. The first one has to do with creating your leaven for the, the, the loaves. Now the tartine recipe calls for a very unique leaven build where it's a long, slow, cool leaven build. It calls for using about 10 grams of starter per 100 grams of flour and water. So it's like doing a 10x feeding of your starter and keeping that at a very cool temperature, 65 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 18 degrees Celsius, for 12 hours overnight. The reason for that is because in tartine, Chad Robertson likes this idea of a very low acid, young leaven. So he's trying to do a super slow build of the leaven that favors the yeast development, but it does not favor the lactic acid bacteria. It's very hard to do that. So a lot of people try to replicate the tartine recipe, but they do it at warmer temperatures, which is exactly what I ended up doing. I started out at a very cold temperature, and then I compensated at the back end by getting it back up to room temperature, which at the time was 77 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 degrees Celsius. And you somewhat defeat the purpose. You build up the, the, the yeast, but at higher temperatures, you're also introducing favoring the lactic acid bacteria and possibly favoring the protease enzyme, which deteriorates the gluten in your loaf. So the tartine recipe is tricky unless you can follow it exactly. So I, I recommend trying to follow it exactly as written because when you modify from that, it can have deleterious effects on the use of it in your loaves. The second thing is when we talk about water temperature, I showed a lot of great examples um, and I found it to be tremendously helpful to have this water temperature chart. Again, when you're standing around waiting for your stretching and folding at 30 minute breaks, just create a spreadsheet and start doing experiments in your microwave so that you can have a table that says, if I have 500 grams of water and I need to get it to 91 degrees Fahrenheit, how long do I have to put it in the microwave? This just saves a lot of time. And when you're, you're doing your water uh, temperature, trying to hit your water temperature, uh, 
I try to overshoot the target by a couple of degrees. Then I can blend it down with cool water and get it to the exact correct temperature. And as I demonstrated throughout, you always want to mix your water after it comes out of the microwave because it doesn't heat evenly. You'll get hot spots and cold spots in your water unless you mix it. One of the other things that I didn't really demonstrate was changing your dough temperature through air temperature. And this is an example when you put it in the proofing chamber. In all of these examples, because I, I got really good at calculating my water temperature, I was able to have my dough temperature at or above the desired temperature. So when it went into the proofing chamber, I could set the proofing chamber temperature at exactly what I needed and it stayed very consistent. What routinely happens, what happened to me many more times than not, is I would mix up the dough trying to hit, say, 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius, and I would come in at 78 degrees Fahrenheit after I mixed the dough. So now I have to raise my dough temperature by four degrees. The way that you do that is in your proofing chamber, and you could set the proofing chamber temperature to 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius, but you'll see it takes a long time to move the dough temperature up when you undershoot your target temperature with the dough. It's very hard to move it through air temperature. So there's a temptation to say, my dough temperature isn't getting up to where I need it to be. I'm just gonna crank up the temperature of my proofing chamber, say to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, to try to pull that dough temperature up more quickly. I've tried this, many people try it. It's a mistake you make a few times because what happens is even though that internal dough temperature in the center of the dough seems to be moving very slowly, the outside edges of the dough are at that proofing chamber temperature of 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius. And we know what happens when your dough heats up to that high temperature, even if it's just around the perimeter of the dough, you start to release the protease enzyme, which then breaks down the gluten. So you always wanna resist the temptation of trying to move your dough temperature very quickly by cranking up your proofing chamber temperature. And I didn't show that example here, but I've made that mistake many times in the past. If your dough temperature is too low, it just, it's just gonna take some time and your, your time schedule might go out the window because you have to gradually get that dough back up to the desired temperature. Also, in terms of controlling the temperature in your proofing chamber, I got very good at this over the months using my oven with the light on. And then the other thing that I did in this video is if you add one liter of boiling water into your oven with the light on, you can move the temperature up pretty significantly pretty quickly. So that liter of boiling water or a half liter of boiling water in your microwave, which is a little smaller space, can move your proofing temperature up and down pretty quickly. And then if your proofing chamber gets too warm, you simply just open the door and cool it down, which I did a couple of times. The key, always have a thermometer in your proofing chamber. You can't be guessing at it. it the temperature will move all over the place. And unless you have a thermometer in there, you'll never really know what's happening. One other thing that I learned through this process is in that initial mixing of the dough, when we're trying to hit the desired dough temperature, the process of hand mixing exposes the dough to the room temperature air. And even though your water temperature might be hotter, every time you touch the dough and you turn it and turn it, you're, you're introducing air temperature in it. So hand mixing the dough reduces your dough temperature. And I showed that a few times through both the slap and fold method and just mixing it in the bowl. So always be aware that that process of turning the dough introduces air and it'll reduce your dough temperature down to room temperature, assuming you're trying to hit a dough temperature that's higher than room temperature. If you were going the opposite direction where your dough temperature is cooler than your, warm, than your room temperature, let's say you used cold water to try to slow down your fermentation by hand mixing that dough, it'll raise the temperature up to room temperature. So, so when I say hand mixing reduces the temperature, that's only when you're above room temperature. It really means hand mixing will acclimate the dough to your room temperature, whether your dough is above or below. Very important to remember that because that moved the temperature of the dough more than anything other than adding hot or cold water to it. It moves the temperature much, much more quickly than just putting it in the proofing chamber that activity of turning the dough and introducing the room temperature air 
it was moving at three, four, five degrees Fahrenheit in 30 seconds to 60 seconds. Very important. When we put the loaves into the refrigerator for the, the final proofing, it's helpful to use a thermometer the, the first couple times you do that to get a sense of what's happening in the refrigerator. I love to have these charts uh, so that I can just glance at this and say, okay, what's really happening? Because when you put your dough into the refrigerator, like I said, people think it immediately goes to the refrigerator temperature. It does not. It, it will still continue fermenting for easily three hours before you get down to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius. It sometimes takes 10 to 12 hours for the dough to hit the refrigerator temperature and really stop the fermentation, assuming that you're below, say, 37 degrees Fahrenheit or 3 degrees Celsius. So that refrigerator proofing catches a lot of people off guard because you think that you can immediately stop the fermentation process by putting it in the refrigerator. It doesn't work that way. It just slows it down. That's why it's called a retard instead of an arrest, for example. And then lastly, the, the complex topic of desired dough temperature calculations. Now, I've done a number of experiments with these different desired dough temperature calculations. Let me just give you the quick summary. The, the initial one that, that, that you'll find in various bread books and various websites uses the three-factor or four-factor method. I don't like that calculation because it is really geared towards commercial bakeries where you're mixing in a power mixer and the friction factor of mixing in a power mixer is one of the key variables that that formula is really tailored for. In hand mixing sourdough, we don't have that friction factor, so you're not using one of the key elements that that formula was designed for. And the second aspect of that formula is that it's very heavily biased towards room temperature because when you're mixing the dough in a power mixer for four minutes, six minutes, eight minutes, you're introducing all that room temperature into the dough. So that formula is a very, what I would call room temperature biased formula. Uh, and what we were trying to do here was to create dough temperatures that were much higher than room temperature. And that formula just does not work. It, it would consistently wildly overshoot the water temperature that we would need uh, if I used that standard formula. So I created two alternative formulas. One is the gram weighted calculation. This is the easiest way to think about combining ingredients because if I had 100 grams of water at 90 degrees Fahrenheit and 100 grams of water at 80 degrees Fahrenheit and I add those two together and mix them, the combination gives you 85 degrees Fahrenheit water because the water has the same density and the same molecular structure. So it's simple math if you're mixing the exact same ingredients. So I try to apply that gram weighted calculation to the ingredients and I used that for a while, but what was happening is because flour has a lower density than water, it was over calculating the water temperature. The water temperature will tend to overshoot the target if you use that straight gram weighted calculation. So then I did the secondary adjustment that I used in this video, which is the gram weighted density adjusted calculation. But basically you calculate the grams and the temperature of the ingredients, and you adjust the grams of the flour down by 0.6 to get it to the density of flour. And your starter is at 0.8 density of water. So it equalizes those densities compared to water, which is considered to be 100% in this scenario. This calculation gets incredibly close to giving you a very precise water temperature uh, to get to your desired dough temperature, particularly when you're trying to do these higher temperature mixes that are going above the room temperature. It, it's very accurate over a wide range of temperatures. The desired dough ca temperature calculation, the standard one, really does not work once you start to deviate from room temperature. And then lastly, with a desired dough temperature calculation, one thing that I didn't show in this video is if you were trying to reduce the temperature of your dough. So this would be if you lived in a tropical climate and your flour is in your pantry and it's very warm, your flour may be at 85 degrees Fahrenheit or you know 30 degrees Celsius, 
So you need to mix cool water with that to bring it down to your desired dough temperature. When you're going that opposite direction of trying to reduce the temperature of your flour essentially by adding cool water, then the gram weighted calculation works perfectly. You don't need to do the density adjustment. I don't know why that works. I'm not a scientist. Uh, maybe somebody could explain that someday. But basically, I know that I have two formulas. One is if I'm trying to raise my temperature above room temperature and raise my flour temperature, I use the density adjusted gram weighted version. If I'm trying to go the opposite direction, I just use the straight gram weighted version and you don't have to adjust for the density. So what have we learned after all of this experimentation? Some people might say, I just watched a two and a half hour video and all I learned is that I have to let my dough rise 25%. I guess that's an overly simplistic way to look at it if you have unlimited time for baking and you really don't care about the schedule, which is uncommon. What we learned here in this video is that we have tools available to us so that we're not at the mercy of our kitchen temperature. For example, in the coming winter, if my kitchen temperature is 70 degrees Fahrenheit and I decide I want to make an 85 degree loaf, I know how to do that. I know how to calculate my water temperature to get an 85 degree dough temperature. I know how to set up my proofing chamber to be exactly 85 degrees and I know how to calculate with very high precision how long my bulk fermentation needs to be at 85 degrees and I know how to calculate when to watch the bulk fermentation for when it's done because it's the last 15% of my calculated bulk fermentation time. So it liberates you, it frees you from being at the mercy of your kitchen temperature. And then by being able to control the temperature, what that really allows you to do is to control the most precious resource we have, which is time. So now I can set up a baking schedule and I can say, I only have eight hours to bake today. What do I need to do to get all of my activity to happen within eight hours? And I can back into the calculation to say, I need to bulk ferment my dough at 87 degrees Fahrenheit, for example, to get my baking schedule to work within an eight hour window. That is really what we've learned here today. It's the tools and the techniques to manage temperature and time because that frees up your baking schedule it allows you to bake more bread, it allows you to share more bread, and most importantly, it allows you to eat more bread. Thank you for sticking with this. I know this was a long, complicated video with a lot in it. This was the most challenging experiment I've ever tried, but it was also one of the most interesting and rewarding in terms of what I learned from it. I hope you learned from it as well. When I think about sourdough baking and what's important as a sourdough baker, is to me, sourdough baking is all about mastering bulk fermentation. And mastering bulk fermentation is all about mastering this interplay of time and temperature. So what we did here is at the core of sourdough baking. I mean, this is really where you get so deep into the science of sourdough that that's where you create the art. Many people learn these things over baking hundreds and hundreds of loaves. I tried to compress a lot of knowledge and a lot of learning into one short uh, video here, relatively short, compared to what it would take if you tried to learn this all through your own trial and error. So again, thank you for sticking with it. I enjoyed making this video. Now I'm going to go eat some bread.